Hi, everyone. Great to have you with us for today's event, State of Selenium and Test Automation, Leading Experts Share Their Vision for Things to Come. We have an incredible expert panel. Our host is Dave Hafner, and joining him on this expert panel are Ashley Hunsberger, Karen Sandler, and Joe Colantonio, and they will all uh, introduce themselves uh, in a minute. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll, t I'll let Dave take it from here. Great. Thanks, Adi. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, so let's go ahead and start with introductions. And Ashley, let's start with you and then work our way to the right with the slide here. So you, then Karen, then Joe, and then I'll, I'll intro myself after. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Ashley. I am a product quality architect at Blackboard. I'm one of the volunteers on the conference organizing committee. Um, and I met Dave several years ago at a conference. And he's wrote me in and sparked interest in all things Selenium for me. So uh, thanks for having me. Great. Karen? Hi, I'm Karen Sandler. I am the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, which is a nonprofit home of Selenium. Um, I am a cyborg in that I have a pacemaker defibrillator. And I am trying to find the source code in my own body, which has made me passionate about software freedom and the charitable side of free and open source software. I also helped organize the conference. Great. And Joe? Sure. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I'm Joe from JoeColantonio.com, TestTalks.com, and Automation Guild, a blog, podcast, and online conference dedicated to all things test automation related. And I'm excited to be on this panel, especially with Ashley and Karen, who actually were some of my favorite speakers at this year's conference. So I think it's going to be an awesome session. Great. Thanks. Um, so uh, the concise way that I describe what I do is I'm, I'm Dave Hefner and I dabble with Selenium. Uh, so I've written some books about it. I help organize the conference. I'm on the, the leadership committee uh, for the Selenium project proper. I'm a committer on the project. Um, and, I'm, and I basically have been free and independent with my own business doing stuff with Selenium for five years. Um, so um, I'm your host today. And so the goal of this, uh, this webinar and panel is for us to kind of deconstruct and decompose um, what happened last month in Austin, Texas, Selenium Conf, uh, which is our first time back in the US uh, since, um, well, it feels like it's been so long I can't even remember. And so uh, the hope is that you can walk away, not just with an understanding of some of the highlights for us at the conference, but also kind of um, a future forecast of what you can come to expect um, within the industry and how it impacts your job and uh, and just kind of the landscape of uh, of test automation and, and all things surrounding it. So. Um, so just a quick little preamble, though, for those that don't know, um, Selenium Conf um, is just like uh, the Selenium Project. It's it's organized and, and happens largely by the help of volunteers, myself included. Ashley and Karen um, mentioned that she was also uh, very influential in, in a lot of what went on, um, and she's actually part of uh, a nonprofit charity which helps um, handle a lot of the uh, legal and financial um, uh, things that we have to deal with uh, in order to not get arrested and be able to pay for things. And so um, just uh, everything that goes into it um, we, is based on passion and, uh, and, and what we think is a service to the community. And so this webinar included, um, of course, thanks to the, the help of Apple Tools for helping organize and get the word out about it. And so, um, so now that we've had some time panel uh, to kind of digest our time at uh, the conference in Austin, um, I always like to bring it back to maybe talks you've attended um, or conversations you had or topics that just seem to kind of percolate throughout the event for you. Um, so uh, the first place I'd like to start is I'd really like to get a sense of if there were um, one or two favorite talks that you uh, were able to attend that really just stuck with you. Um, and so I think what we could do is um, we'll start at the end of the panel, work our way backwards. So Joe, if you want to start and then we can work to Karen and then Ashley and then myself. Sure. So uh, I had a lot of favorites. Like I said, I really loved Ashley's and Karen's session. Uh, the one that really excited me, though, was the um, Star Driver talk by Dave. Not by Dave, by um, Dan, Dan. Chalou. Uh, he's the creator of Appium. And uh, I really love the concept of having one protocol to automate everything. And the way they, show, they demoed the product, they had someone from Microsoft actually showing their implementation of the WinApp driver. And that really brought home to me how you know, not only is open source vendors embracing open source, of course, but how non 
open source vendors are embracing open source. Someone like Microsoft, where back in the day when you're someone my age, would have not even looked at open source, where now they're actually actively contributing to it. So I was really excited about that development. And uh, it kind of leads into something that Karen was talking about, how uh, why open source is so important. And I think a lot more companies that were against open source are now embracing it more. So that, that's why I really enjoyed that particular session. Oh, that's awesome. Um, just, just to add on to that, that, that I just want to make sure I, this is a mental note for myself, but that brings up two really interesting points. One is that um, more corporate involvement from commercial tool vendors who traditionally turned a blind eye towards Selenium and effectively competed. Um, you're seeing kind of a phase shift in favor of incorporating Selenium into their offerings. And then the other one is, um, and we'll come back to this later, but accessibility testing. This, this is uh, just a hook for that later. So, uh, Karen? So I'd say, like, on a um, on an overall comment about the conference, uh, I, I wanted to say that I think that the Selenium conference is just extraordinary in the people that it attracts and the the kind of all of the hallway conversation and the you know general percolation of ideas that happens there. I was really impressed. I think like historically, um, developers and website deployment people and testing people haven't had a lot of crossover, and I think Selenium basically overcomes that and it's created a community where um, where all of those people are together in the same community working together and I think that's extraordinary and I think it was also really represented in the talks themselves. Uh, I liked a ton of talks as well. I think um, if I had to pick one to highlight, I would probably highlight NG Jones, Aesop Fables, as an, um, uh, sorry, it was uh, the build that cried broken, building yes. trust in your CI tests um, and it's a uh, she used Aesop's Fables as like an introduction to basic concepts. It was, um, in addition to uh, being a very entertaining talk, it covered a lot of the the, the uh, core core subject matter, and I thought it was really really good. Yeah, that was a really great talk. Um, awesome. Um, I don't think I have anything to add other than um, it's great when we have good talks that cover um, both kind of more introductory and intermediate things as well as a couple of more advanced things that people run into and in a very approachable way. Um, a lot of times there's a big disconnect between a more beginning approach for, you know, it, it, it was approachable for everybody basically and I think that that was a really great talk. Um, great. Ashley? Um, yeah, I echo everything that Joe and Karen have said. One thing overall about the conference that I've enjoyed is that we've seen a variety of the talks and the roles that they can be applied to. I think we saw talks in leadership and guiding change, as well as in-depth technical talks, um, some on performance and continuous integration and delivery, um, as well as in the AWS. Um, so I felt we had something for everybody, which was really exciting. I've been to other conferences where I have not seen that before. Um, so I felt it was very inclusive. Um, and I think that makes it easier for people that may not feel as comfortable um, at, at different types of things. So I think we did a really good job trying to be inclusive in that community. Uh, as far as my favorite talk, I had two that really stood out to me. Um, one is Karen's. So to be in her talk on the software freedom conservancy. So to be honest, until I started volunteering with the conference organizing committee, I did not know what the conservancy was. <laughs> Worse, I did not have a real opinion on open source software or its importance uh, until I met Dave and then, of course, Karen. And I was really excited to meet you, Karen. Um, a lot of it is the invisible work that you all do and you've highlighted. It's, it's astounding the amount of work that the Conservancy puts in uh, to all of their projects, and I really thank you for that. Um, and things that just you highlighted that I thought were incredible were the, the evidence that supports why we need to take action and why open source software is so important. Um, and if we don't promote free and open alternative, we're stuck with proprietary software. But I think the thing that really resounded with me the most, Karen, is just your application of why you need it and the fact that you're a cyborg and once into the source code in your body, it's just, it's mind blowing to me because it's not something that you think about every day. I mean, in your talk, the, even the manufacturers was like source code. <laughs> um, so it was really interesting to me and thank you so much for that. That's awesome. Um, Karen, do you have anything to add to that? If not, I can move on. Um, I would just say I'm, I'm so glad that you liked the talk, and I want to just 
I double down on this whole volunteer and uh, situation with the conference, which is that <laughs> Ashley and Dave and everybody else who uh, who helps organize the conference does so um, almost all of them in their in volunteer capacity. And the fact that we are a very small charity, uh, we being Conservancy, and the Selenium team is uh, is motivated so much by volunteers is amazing. And the um, yeah. professional level of the conference was, I think, very impressive, considering that it's done from a more charitable perspective. Um, yeah. I I did have a second talk that stood out to me. Um, sure. I need to interject. But, yeah, go ahead. Um, it's actually Meredith Payne on embracing innovation. And I believe Meredith was a first-time speaker, if I'm not mistaken. And That's right. I love when people are willing to share their knowledge, and especially for the first time. Um, I thought she knocked it out of the park. I remember my first time as a speaker. I was scared to death. That's actually when I met you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, it, you know, I thought she did such a great job. She talked about her experiences and failures. We all like a good experience report, I think, at least I do. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought she did such a good job not only telling her story, but the framework and the thought process that she goes through and how she embraces innovation. So the fact that Selenium Conference embraces first-time speakers as well and wants them to feel comfortable and to share their stories is, I think, a testament to Selenium Project itself as well. Well, that's a great point because um, it ties it back to the program selection, which um, I think historically has been a bit um, opaque for people, and that's something we're trying to make uh, more transparent. I think at all levels of the project, of the Selenium project, we're trying to increase a lot of things. We're trying to always um, strive for, for better diversity within the project at all levels, uh, as well as um, diversity within the program selection, not just in terms of um, diversity of your ethnicity, um, but also just um, in terms of uh, the topics of, that you're interested in. And, and, uh, and so we really try to get a smattering uh, for the for the program. And I just want to, just a quick side note soapbox, like we're basically, we're trying um, a couple of things for this new, this next Selenium conference. We're, um, we're going to write up a blog post or two about the specifics about what goes into our process. Um, and and that way people are more aware of uh, what it is that we look for as a program committee, why we make the decisions we make, and so that there's more rationale and understanding about um, us as kind of a hive mind of volunteers. And granted, it's a very small um, team for the uh, program selection. It's typically between four and five people um, who, who select the entirety of the program. Uh, but this is, of course, um, in addition to their day jobs, as Karen was saying, um, and there's largely more and more submissions uh, for talks every conference. Um, and and uh, literally every conference, there's more. Uh, and so we had something on the order of um, well over 200, probably close to 300 submissions that four or five of us had to kind of wade through and, and try to provide thoughtful feedback on um, as much as we could um, and just pick out the best ones. And, and we're still going through the process of giving feedback to people that we um, we didn't accept. And so we're trying to make sure that people do feel inclusive. And, um, and I think that there's always a potential perception that we missed the mark. And so we're really trying to make, make strides to, to change that and, and constantly improve. Um, and so Marcus Morell is another one of the organizers and he, uh, he did uh, get some of his employees to go to the conference and he joked that um, they weren't test engineers, but they managed to map a course through the program um, that really fit with their specific specialty and their job. And so that's something we tried to do. Um, and, and so that's, I think, hopefully why we attract also a diversity of, of different job roles and, and people who get to commingle that might not. And you see some really interesting ideas percolate. And so for me, um, the, the conference, um, the most interesting talks are not the ones on the stage, although they're always really great. Um, and I do have a couple of favorites, but for me, it's always the hallway track. Um, it's the thing I encourage everyone to do every Every conference, I encourage them to meet as many people as they can, have as many great conversations as they can, and, and I think that the, the people that you meet at these conferences are, uh, they forge such long-lasting relationships that really have a big impact and influence on, on your career. And for me, um, this was really um, highlighted at my very first software development conference I went to in 2009 in Chicago. I met um, Jason Huggins and Adam Goucher, and, and the conversations I had when I met from when I met them were um, transformative into the things I do now. Um, and so I'm, I'm such a big proponent of, of just who you meet and, uh, and just the social time that you have and the chance to, to commingle. As far as favorite talks, um, I will uh, add on to, to your praise uh, and plus one, Ashley, of uh, Karen's talk. And that's largely um, because I'm, I'm also a big fan of open source, but also 
I think because it helped demystify a lot of um, misunderstanding around what it is that Selenium is. A lot of people, I think, um, assume, um, and, and not wrongly, uh, that, that Selenium might just be some big company that employs people to build this tool. Uh, and it's not that at all. And Karen, your talk was great at um, really um, sh shining a light behind the curtain of, of who the wizards are that <laughs> help uh, make this thing happen. Um, and uh, and so there's there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of uh, volunteers, some a, a few, uh, and then a few people from a nonprofit charity. And, and it's just like um, by virtue of uh, pure passion and a, and a lot of hard work and, and I, I guess lucking into a really uh, resonating problem for people. I think that's why Selenium has been successful and kind of transformative in the industry. And, and I think that, um, so I think I'm just glad that that talk happened because I really feel like it's the kind of thing that should have happened like at the very first Selenium Conf and we didn't do it until now. And I, I just, I'm really glad that we have it on uh, on tape so that we can, so the world can see it. Um, and just for everyone as they're kind of hearing us talk about these things, um, if you actually go to YouTube and search Selenium Conf, um, there's a Selenium Conf user, uh, and where all the videos are listed. So under the Selenium Conf YouTube channel, basically, there's um, every conference talk uh, is freely available from Austin and also from London and also from India and also, and so you just go back, there's a back catalog. Um, but all the talks that we're referencing are freely available if you haven't seen them. Um, and so, uh, so that's my favorite, um, I would say. Uh, although I'm always a big fan of the keynote talks. I think keynotes are always something we put a lot of thought into. Um, I think we're a bit, um, different than some conferences who encourage uh, keynoters to maybe submit a talk uh, and then go through a, re a review process similar to what they do for the general talk track. Um, but we actually, um, we invite keynoters, uh, people that we think would have some really interesting perspective to share. And, um, and so that's pretty much it. We say, come and talk about whatever it is that you want. <laughs> and we just give a, a soapbox to, to someone to go and do that. And so uh, just, just kind of looking ahead a little bit, um, there is a conference happening, and the next Slam conference is happening later this year in Berlin in October, and, and Ashley, uh, Ashley Hunsberger is giving a keynote. And we're really excited to, uh, that she's stepping up to, to the stage, and, and we're really excited to see and hear what she has to say. Um, so uh, other than that, the one other plug I would say um, is lightning talks. It's something that we've done since the very first uh, Sel um, Selenium Conf. And uh, it's a great platform. It's you get up on, you know, just people who are attendees. They're just attendee talks that are five minutes and people get up and just talk and show something cool that they're working on. And there are some real gems in there um, that are worth checking out. And those are all also available on the YouTube uh, channel. So, um, so that I think covers favorite talks. Um, and what I'd like to do is maybe switch gears a little bit into talking about kind of um, themes and topics um, that, that you, you might sense uh, or have noticed are becoming more commonplace. And, and to give an example, um, a, a couple of years ago, the first time that we were um, in India uh, for the conference is 2014. And um, I remember that the concept of automated visual testing um, was very much sci-fi to a lot of people. Uh, and, uh, and it's something that people, you know, in small pockets and fringes really wanted. And, uh, and now it's very common. Like we, we at least have two talks at, at each Selenium Conf about this topic. Uh, I think that there's um, copious amounts of open source solutions that are available. There's a couple uh, of commercial solutions out there. There's one really great uh, commercial solution available, hint, hint, they may have helped organize this webinar. Um, and so I think that it's, um, it's something that used to just kind of be not really commonplace in the, in the thought process and talked about widely. And so now that's, that's pretty much like, you know, people who are doing test automation really well are doing something with automated visual testing, right? That's like a table stakes requirement almost. Um, and it automates something that people just didn't realize, um, could be automated. And so, that's kind of my segue into this thematic um, thing. And, and it could be talks and topics and conversations you had that hint at a topic, or it could be something that you would wish <laughs> that, that was talked about more. Um, and so let's start with you, Ashley, um, and then work our way um, to the right. Um, yeah, thank you. So one thing I wish that, or I'm hoping to see more of is talk around accessibility. Um, it's been a passion of mine for several years now. Um, a lot of people don't know this. I, I have had a blind grandmother. Um, you know, just 
there's certain things in life that happen to you and you don't know when they're going to hit and all of a sudden, you know, wow, I can't use my computer screen or I, I need to tab through my keyboard. Um, it, it's really fascinating to me. And it's things that you don't even think about sometimes. And I've had many discussions now since Austin with uh, Manoj, one of the committers. And um, we've been talking a lot about accessibility, so I'm, I'm hoping to see that take a bit more traction in, in the automation sphere, um, but also just in everybody's understanding of what it is. And it's, it's not just about, um, you know, a blind user that can't see their screen. There's so many forms that you don't even know exist today. Um, and really, it's building an application for everybody. Um, you know, the 20%, the 30%, depending where you're living, that, that may not have the same um, level of ability that you do. And thinking about it that way and then ensuring that we're building that quality in uh, for those users as well and not isolating them. That, I'd really that, like to see us start thinking about that. That's really cool. I, I agree. And I think there was um, there's some really telling examples. So um, at least one from it, there was one talk that I think, uh, people don't realize, but um, the talk that you brought up, Joe, around uh, StarDriver and the desktop application automation uh, for both Windows and and uh, Mac, it's really interesting is that fundamentally those are working with accessibility hooks to interact with the applications. And so I think that the um, it, there's the balance of like doing it because it's it's right for you know as many users as possible. the I think the the real obvious business case too, beyond that is um that, it makes any app that's built with accessibility is infinitely easier to automate your testing against. And so um, I, I'm really excited to see what kind of things start to shake out from that. And I really hope that that just becomes like a very table stakes thing where we accept again, you know, like two or three talks that are really awesome about accessibility testing. I really hope that that becomes yeah. something more common. There's also um, right now the Ministry of Press has a 30, had a 30 day challenge out I think for April for World Accessibility Day, and it's interesting. It's for each day you go through and do an accessibility challenge, and you really learn a lot doing through that process. And one thing that we had our team do was throw away your mouse for the day um, and see if you can even do that. And I think I made it about 30 minutes before I banged my head on my desk. <laughs> and just trying to use that. <laughs> so it's it's really interesting way to learn, you know, what you're really building for people, but also what enables better automation. So totally, yeah. yeah and I think that there's, I think what we're, you know, what might we might start to see, which would be really great, would be um, some open source um, solutions that are good for assessing and auditing an application for uh, how well it it actually follows best practices for accessibility. Because it's like if a blind screen reader, uh, if like just a screen reader that, that someone who is blind would use, like if it can navigate your website and they could, you know, someone could interact through that uh, device, then then Selenium could, is basically doing the same thing. Um, and so I think the same can be argued for, for mobile as well. And I think that, um, I think that that would be really tremendous to see more talks, and especially more libraries, um, hopefully libraries that are made by awesome people who then say, this is something I want to put within the Software Freedom Conservancy, and then ta-da. Um, yeah. that's, my, that's my segue to talk to move on to you, Karen. <laughs> well, I was going to actually just uh, just double down on what uh, what Ashley said and say that um, and what you've said, Dave, and that I, I agree entirely. And that working on accessibility issues not only help uh, help the individual communities that you target through accessibility work, but it helps everyone. And I think an example of this at the conference was the captioning that was available. Um, captioning is is something that's critical at conferences to be inclusive to people who maybe have trouble hearing, but um, but everyone benefits from having captioning during the talk. And I'd never been to a conference with live captioning before. i have been to one other since then, actually. And it was a huge help. Um, and I heard people throughout the conference talking about uh, how helpful it is that you can look up and, and see um, what the speaker is saying at the same time. And the captioning was excellent. Um, oh, yeah, that's actually so a really good that point. Really There's something that's something we started doing in London last year, and we did it again this conference, and I think we're going to try to make that something we do every conference. And the side benefit is that we try to um, take those live captioning um, text, those transcripts effectively from the talk, and incorporate those into the, the YouTube videos that we upload. 
So the, the except that carries over. Uh, so we do try to make sure that that's accessible for people also. That's fantastic. And another theme that I liked seeing at the conference was um, was sort of an encouraging um, encouragement for new people to get involved. Um, I took note that Simon said in his keynote, uh, "How do you become a more sophisticated developer? You make mistakes." And so, <laughs> sort of um, an acknowledgement that um, that everyone has to start somewhere, and also that um, uh, that the Selenium community is is open and welcoming to more people digging in and getting involved in key levels. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I actually encourage everyone um, to check out Simon's keynote. I thought it was uh, really great uh, for two reasons. Uh, well, I guess three. One, the one you just mentioned. He's definitely um, encouraging of ha having people get involved. That was um, a great theme that he carried forward um, through all of his conversations, I think. Um, and the other one was that he this is the first keynote I've watched where there was there was code. Uh, he, he was showing slides of code about like mistakes he's made throughout the years in the project. And I thought that that was tremendous. Um, and, and so that was great. And then the other one was um, after I, I gave him the intro to get on stage, he, he did say uh, the words, watch me whip, watch me nay nay. And so that was the other. So do, do watch the talk uh, for, for those three reasons and maybe some others. But um, I think that'd be great. Um, and I guess I'm just thinking in terms of other things for inclusiveness um, to, to dovetail with what you were saying, Karen, um, anyone that wants to get involved at, at any level of the project, you know, that's something that we are um, always open to um, in terms of um, potentially volunteering for the conference, um, helping out uh, in terms of things within the Selenium project proper. Um, I think that at all levels, even if you're, um, you don't find, fancy yourself like a, sophistic, a sophisticated developer. It doesn't matter. Like if you're a user of Selenium, there's always something that you could help out with. You can either um, be on our, our chat channel. We both have a, an IRC chat channel and a Slack. Um, and and uh, these are things that enables you to talk with other, other people who are on the project as well as people who come and ask for help. Like you could potentially help someone solve a problem. Um, you could contribute some documentation to the project. Um, and, and these are, there's, there's, basically infinite things that could be done by people who just want to show up. Um, that's really how this, uh, how this works. It's, uh, and there's not, not being wait, uh, you don't wait to be like kind of offered. You just show up and say, Hey, how can I help? And that's how I got, I got, uh, involved and then I somehow hoodwinked Ashley uh, into doing it as well. And, <laughs> and Karen, you were already here, so I didn't have to hoodwink anyone there. And then, um, and then okay. Joe, I'm slowly working on you. And then, uh, and so, um, but Joe, do you have any um, any themes or topics that jumped out at you? Absolutely. Um, I have a few high-level themes. Well, the first one, I definitely agree. I was at a Selenium conference in 2013, and the, the end closing keynote, the same, pretty much the same people that were there in 2013 were also there in 2017. And like you mentioned, this is an open source project, and people are contributing their time for free. But I, I agree that more people should contribute, more people should volunteer. I'm guilty of myself, so I highly recommend everyone do contribute. And everyone, it is an opening community, so I don't know why um, we couldn't have more people volunteering. Uh, I guess the other two main issues I've noticed was, not issues, but uh, main themes was culture. So what I mean by culture is, you know, Ashley talked about culture in her, her, her talk. Uh, Angie Jones, even though she was talking about CI, CD, um, a lot of the issues that she brought up was due to culture issues. And also Greg uh, Sploy uh, talked about CICD, but a lot of things he touched upon was culture. So it's always funny for me, I work for a large company, I've been there for 10 years, and I always think, oh, it must be better at another company. The grass is probably always greener. I bet you when you work in Silicon Valley, it's all different, it's all you know unicorns, and it's beautiful, and everyone does everything right. And man, I, you know, the hallway tracks, it's not true. Everyone, everyone has issues with automation. Everyone has the same exact issues, and a lot of it isn't necessarily technical, it's culture-based. And so I, I, I thought it was kind of interesting. A lot of these different talks, even though they're talking about different subjects, uh, the underlining uh, cause of a lot of the issues had to do with culture. And uh, yeah. That's awesome. Um, so uh, I actually think it's worth, worth maybe spending a little bit of time on your talk, Ashley. I, just, I was curious if maybe you'd want to uh, be open to giving a quick elevator pitch about what you talked about. Sure. So my talk was on transformative culture and how we essentially went from a model where uh, I guess you could say everybody, every tester on a team was expected to do all the testing. We're no longer called a QA team and we've made the shift to engineering productivity. Uh, a lot of this based 
on how Google tests software. So I, I don't mean to enter a plug-in for this book, but it has been you know transforming for our team. And we've done, I would say my job also went into sales. <laughs> As we start talking with engineers and engineering managers, um, where I was not typically working with them before, and really building this culture of the entire Scrum team owning quality. But what we weren't agreeing to was writing the test for them. We were providing the framework, we were providing the processes and the tools for them to be able to do so, and we would help guide them on what to test um, to be able to test smarter. But the team ultimately had to take ownership of this quality and my talk was largely around how we did that um, from going from QA to engineering productivity to introducing risk analysis to the team so that they learn how to walk through a feature and learn how to test and the things that our testers think about because it's an art and you you have to practice it it's not a oh i read this now i'm going to go do it and i'm good it's something that takes practice and you have to hone your craft. Um, so that's that's my pitch and what I talked about. That, that's awesome. Well, thanks thanks for sharing that. Uh, I think that that's uh, for those of you that that are struggling, which is probably a lot of people with culture or uh, behavioral roadblocks in terms of um, moving things to the next level with your test automation practice uh, or just testing in general at your organization. I think that it's really worth checking out Ashley's talk. There's a lot of really great um, tidbits in there that are worth um, worth gleaning. Thank you. Um, and, and so on that same kind of um, note around culture process, that sort of thing, um, I think that there there are talks, um, depending where we take the conference, there are sometimes talks that, that seem largely specific to um, the region. Uh, I know in India, one thing that comes up a, a lot um, was talk submissions around getting a job in test automation in Selenium. And that's just something that we largely don't um, see a lot of um, in the US and even in London, I don't think we saw that many. Um, so, because we typically talk more about um, everything else around, like the technical aspects, the technical challenges, and and so um, around the getting a job um, theme, um, that is something that was absent. Um, but I think it's something that's out there that people might not realize. And the reason I bring it up is, um, given that we work in open source, I mean, a lot of people use Selenium. Um, and that might be as far as it goes with your interaction with Selenium. But say you find a bug and you want to uh, commit a fix. Um, uh, and you work full time for a company, um, you may actually not own your own copyright and not you may be aware of that, you may not be aware of that, but you may actually find a lot of complication in terms of contributing back to an open source project. And so I, I want to kind of turn this over to you a little bit, Karen, because um, I think there's this really great initiative that, you, that the uh, Software Freedom Conservancy is working on called the Contract Patch Initiative. Um, and I was curious if you maybe want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. So, uh, so Contract Patch is an initiative we launched, which is to help developers better um, and and uh, um, contributors of all sorts better understand and negotiate their employment agreements. Um, so we're basically providing language and also kind of an overview. I think a lot of people don't realize that their employment agreements can be negotiated, um, but. Uh, uh, but one of the uh, so I didn't disclose this in the introductions, but I'm uh, I am a lawyer too. <laughs> um, <laughs> sometimes I, I hide that fact. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, one of the things that we learn in law school is basically whenever you present a contract to a party that you're negotiating with, you always make it more favorable to you than you expect to wind up with. So there's always room for negotiation. So when you're presented with an agreement, it's usually usually means that it's not the one that is. Uh, it, it's not the version that the company is actually prepared to settle on with you, and that by making requests of them, you're much more likely to um, you know, to wind up at something. Like the company always, or a party, all, a sophisticated party always keeps back a few clauses that they're willing to give you. And so even if you ask for something that they can't give you, they have something in their back pocket to say, well, we can't give you that, but we can give you this. So if you don't negotiate your employment agreement, you're basically taking an agreement that's not the best that's not the agreement that the company is already prepared to offer you when you start negotiating that. And it, you know, and, and the terms of your employment agreement are like another kind of compensation. So if you, um, you know, if you're, if you ask for a certain salary and the company sort of, um, you know, is limited in the budget they can give you, these clauses are one of the things that, um, that, that you can negotiate with. And one of the clauses that comes up a lot in free and open source software is, is making sure that you own the code to your own. Um, so, so 
some employment agreements, and it varies from place to place, and I will keep this short, I promise, <laughs> but it varies from, from, from place to place. So like in California, if you've watched Silicon Valley, you might know, uh, or some other TV shows, so California has very favorable um, for uh, laws for employees. Um, and so there's a limit to what um, what employ employers can claim in a contract. But in a lot of states within the United States, like my home state of New York, um, that's not necessarily the case. And so in your employment agreement, you may actually not have, and you can hear my New York sirens in the background, <laughs> but uh, but uh, you you may not actually have the ability to own um, code or, or other copyrights that you create even outside of the scope of your employment. The company you work for sometimes in these contracts owns everything, and that's um, and that's not something that I think a lot of employees um, anticipate, and they don't necessarily have the um, the interest or the means to review their employment agreements closely. Um, and so, uh, and so you can take a look at um, on Conservancy's website sfconservancy.org. I think it's slash contract patch, um, and you can see a series of blog posts basically about the um, the basic ideas around this, and then we're working on contract language that uh, that you can present as an alternative to be helpful. On the, the more general idea, I think um, one of the neat things about the Soining community is that there were participants, um, and I saw this at the conference in Austin, is that there were participants at the conference from uh, from so many companies. There were some companies that had concentrations, but the, the reach of Selenium is so broad that um, I think what you're saying, Dave, is right, which is that some of the companies that are um, are using Selenium heavily um, aren't aren't necessarily sophisticated about free and open source software and don't necessarily have policies in place for having their employees contribute. And this is um, not as insurmountable as it may seem. Um, and I would say that the best advice I have for you is to just engage with the process. Um, having um, having developers or having the technical folks in the um, in the company raise these issues initially makes it much more helpful for the legal for legal and management to be able to put sane policies in place. Um, and those companies that partner um, with technical people wind up with much better. Um, policies in the long run too and that helps the free and open source software project that they're um, relying on as well awesome well th thanks for sharing about that um and and i think for those of you that um you can uh, want to learn more you can either check out the blog as, as karen mentioned and also um the uh, there's a there's a podcast augcast uh called free as in freedom which karen does with bradley another member of the uh, sfc um, and there is an episode recently uh, about that. So if you go to faif.us, um, that would be the best place to find that. Um, and uh, there, there are other initiatives that the SFC is doing, but um, I don't, uh, we don't really have time, unfortunately, to talk too much about them. But there's this thing called Outreachy. You might want to check it out. Um, but I do want to bring it back to a couple other themes um, before we get into questions. And so. Um, there were a few things that I think we start to see more of, and we definitely try to incorporate more each year. Um, and things like security testing, um, we always try to have at least one talk for that. And we actually had, we were fortunate to have a keynote about it as well. So we had one general talk and then a keynote, and we're looking into some some ways to try to have that be more uh, part of the, the common uh, conversation that we bring uh, when we take the conference up to new places. Um, and uh, load testing is another one. Um, there was a, a great talk on uh, leveraging Selenium and JMeter. Like you can basically repurpose your Selenium tests to create load tests. And there's great things like that out there. Um, and then um, one thing though we don't really cover, uh, which could almost have its own conference, uh, is performance testing. And uh, and so um, I do want to take a moment and just turn this over to you, Joe. Uh, I know you have some opinions about performance testing, and I'd love to, to hear your thoughts about that. Oh, thanks, Dave. So actually, great topic. Uh, I definitely agree. There is different niches within niches. So test automation, I believe automation is about all kinds of automation, not just UI automation. And I think one of those places nowadays where people are, are trying to automate, trying to do shift left and shift right uh, is performance testing, but there's not a lot of information you can get. You go to a conference and you get it in little pieces, but you don't get a conference dedicated 100% to it. So uh, I decided to create a conference called Perf Guild that I'll be putting on the end of July for three days. It's going to be all online. All the speakers are listed there. So if you go to perfguild.com, you can check it out. But uh, we have a lot of people talking about how you can leverage 
performance testing within your CI CD systems. And it actually goes along, like what Dave said, there were some sessions at Selenium Conf, how people are already doing this and there's, there seems to be a really demand for how do we actually start incorporating performance testing within our CI CD system. So I think it's a, hopefully it'll be an add value to the community. So it's the first time putting it on. So if anyone has any suggestions, let me know or topics they'd like to see, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, and uh, just to add on to that, you, you also had not too long ago another conference of a similar format, right? An online conference uh, called Automation Guild, which I took I was fortunate enough to take part in. And I thought that um, of all the online uh, test automation conferences or online tech conferences I've uh, I've seen, this was the first one that I actually enjoyed. <laughs> and so uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the Perf Guild and, and uh, curious to see how it turns out. Um, and and uh, just kind of segueing from that into one more thing that I, I know you have some input on, Joe. Um, you published a uh, introvert's guide to Selenium Conf. Is that correct? Is that is that is that the correct title? <laughs> that is the correct title. Yep. <laughs> I'd love to hear um, uh, a little bit about that and and maybe some of the the interviews that you you managed to record while you were at the conference as well. Sure. Yeah. So once again, it goes to how uh, the community here with Selenium is very open. Very, very interested in talking to everyone. It's easy to, to get to meet people. Um, people don't know, they don't think so, but I'm a very much an introvert. I'm very scared when I go outside my room here. And so when I go to a conference, uh, for an icebreaker, I, I like to lurk around, listen to what people's uh, favorite topics were. And uh, I also do a podcast, so I have an excuse to bother people. So a few people I was able to bother because I had my, my official test talks microphone around with me was I was able to get on camera interviewing Ashley Dan, who's the creator of Appium, and also uh, Yusuf Dor from Microsoft to get their opinions on uh, what their session was going to be about, but also get a little more insight on where they see things going. So it was really fun doing that. Um, and I plan on doing that uh, in the future, hopefully. And so it's, it's, it's like I'm just trying to encourage people, don't be afraid. Uh, a lot of times people think they don't have anything to add or they don't have any value to add. And I always think if you have one t t uh, tool or, or tip or technique you could share with someone that's going to save them time and effort, they should try sharing with it. And so that's why I think this, this push for diversity is really important because if you have something that's helping your team, I'm sure it's going to help other teams. So that even if you're an introvert or you feel like you don't fit the, um, the typical mold that you think a, a tester looks like at these conferences, I would encourage you to to really participate, to, 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 put, to put in your opinions, to push forward, and I think uh, everyone would be better for it. That's awesome. Well, thanks thanks for sharing that, Joe. Um, I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that the conference happens not just largely because of um, uh, volunteers and, and the paid attendees who show up, but also because of sponsors. Uh, we have, uh, we're fortunate to attract um, corporate sponsorship um, for a myriad of different benefits that they'll get, you know, People can companies can sponsor different things like the uh, the live stream that we do or um, the coffee stand or other things like we basically get to have nice things because sponsors <laughs> and so um, Karen I, I don't know if uh, if you have some data handy that you want to share about sponsorship or not I unfortunately don't have that much data to hand but uh, but I can say from a, um, a a general view that the conference had about uh, a dozen sponsor exhibitors and the um, the uh, the expo floor was uh, was I thought really amazing and very high quality. Um, I went around and talked to everybody who was an exhibitor there, and um, I saw that um, all the booths were really engaged, which is really impressive. I would be remiss if I didn't also like you did best talks, but you didn't ask me to do like best swag. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, okay, well, what was best there, swag? There, there, yeah, well, I mean, there are raffles and giveaways which were impressive, but only like one or two people got those. Um, but uh, but the the swag at the conference was really kind of impressive. There was uh, so it was for me it was a three way tie. It was the uh, uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprises did a, a pint glass that was served with beer. Um, uh, Apple Tools had a onesie that uh, for babies that says "Visually Perfect," which is amazing. Um, and then Sauce Labs had hot sauce. Which is like uh, I thought all were like pretty pretty cool swag, um, but uh, but I would say that uh, that on any more serious non giveaway level, I thought that um, that the uh, that the 
Expo floor was uh, was really cool because it was uh, compact and um, it was easy to uh, to interact with um, you know with with all the booths and they were very close and um, I thought I thought that was really great. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's definitely an integral part of every conference. Um, and and I do think that the sponsors that we attract are uh, they 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 have a nice balance between um, understanding people's problems and and having a product and and kind of an approach to demonstrating that product that really maps to to the attendees uh, and. Uh, and then they, of course, have cool giveaways, which is always nice. Um, and speaking <laughs> of sponsors, you mentioned Sauce Labs um, as a sponsor. They were uh, they were actually the the, uh, the lead sponsor for the conference. And um, there's a they're holding their first ever user conference uh, next month. And uh, I mention it because both Joe, myself, and Apple Tools will be at that conference. And so if you find yourself there um, and want to say hey, um, come find us, and uh, we'd love to chat. And um, so there's a few things I definitely want to mention before we kind of wrap up and start taking a few questions. Um, so as I mentioned, all of the talks from the conference uh, are recorded and on YouTube. So just go to youtube.com and look up Selenium Conf, um, all in word, and you'll be able to find uh, you find all the videos um, from the conference. And then um, Joe mentioned Perf Guild already, but his his podcast uh, Test Talks is is really awesome. I'm I'm a big fan of it, and uh, it just keeps getting better. So testtalks.com, uh, check that out, and um, We've talked a lot about the Software Freedom Conservancy, and I really think that everyone um, that has any interest in contributing in some way, shape, or form to open source or are curious about uh, taking back maybe some of your rights from your employer's agreements uh, or anything along those lines, um, or interested in checking out something called Outreachy, um, go to sfconservancy.org. That's um, S-F-C-O-N-S-E-R-V-A-N-C-Y.org. Um, and then the the main thing I really want to end with is that um, we're holding a conference again this year. We started doing two a year uh, last year, and we're trying it again this year. And this October, uh, we are holding uh, SlimConf Berlin. So it's the first time that we're going to Germany, and uh, we're really excited about it. And right now, the call for speakers is open, and there's also sponsorship slots are available and open as well. And so the call for speakers is closing soon, though. So June 2nd is the cutoff. Um, so submit a talk, because if you do and it gets accepted, your trip will be paid for. Travel and accommodation will be covered, um, which is something we started doing in earnest um, in London last year. We did it again for Austin this year, and we're going to try to keep doing it every every time we do the conference um, as much as we can. Uh, I think it gets tricky with certain countries we go to, but that's really the goal because um, we think that it it takes a lot uh, to want to submit a talk, and it makes it even easier when you know that your trip will be paid for. Um, it's far easier to clear with work and a whole host of things. So submit a talk, um, and hopefully if it gets accepted, then you get to come to Germany uh, for free. And then um, also shortly after June 2nd, tickets go on sale, um, early access tickets for workshops and for the conference. So do check it out. Go to seleniumconf.com, um, which will get you there. You can also go to seleniumconf.de. It's the same site. Um, and, and do check it out. And uh, we actually have a bunch of stuff up on the site now. We have uh, we don't have keynotes, uh, speakers listed, uh, workshops have been announced. And um, as we start to do some early accepts and accept more talks that'll also go up on the website and we'll work iteratively to get a program and so on and so forth. But basically go there, check it out, and you can sign up to receive updates by email as well. And so um, so that's that's kind of it. And we can um, then segue now to a few different questions. And one that uh, someone submitted uh, was something I think we, we hit on a little bit, but um, talking more about open source tools and um, the support for open source tools versus paid tools. Um, and how are we managing that? Um, and that's a bit of an abstract question, I guess, in, in the who who the pronoun is there, <laughs> but um, I think what uh, what I think they're they're asking is um, when faced with commercial tools that may or may not do the same thing uh, and provide support if there are issues. What are your what are our thoughts about that versus Selenium, which effectively has no support? Um, there's no 1-800 Selenium, um, and given that we use these tools in our day jobs, what's our perspective? Um, about that. Uh, and so, Joe, maybe we'll start with you and then we'll work our way uh, to the left for anyone that has input. So uh, I'm just curious to know what you think, Dave. Uh, uh, th is that the reason why you're trying to go make W3, uh, Selenium a W3C standard? Is that with Selenium 4 vendors are then going to uh, start being responsible for their own implementation of Selenium so that they will then have skin in the game and will be responsible for this? So I think that's one of the things that the project is trying to move towards where 
uh, it's not only them, but now it's actually the vendors of the browsers themselves that are going to implement their own uh, implementations of Selenium, and th therefore we'll have better support that way. It become almost an industry standard at that point. Well, yeah, I think that that's really where it's going. Um, as far as the motivation behind the spec, I just think it was the obvious thing to do from like a development perspective. Um, and if you ask Simon, he'd say something to the effect of, um, he just wants to make sure that we don't end up in the dark days of uh, software testing that we used to have. And so this is his way to move it, move everything forward and make sure there's there's a milestone so there's like a backstop so there's no way to fall back <laughs> and fine. so i think that's his motivation and from like a commercial perspective i think it's phenomenal and we're seeing it already uh is that there are all, a lot of commercial tool vendors are now starting to basically use selenium uh either as some additional implementation to their existing way that they drive browsers and, and devices uh, or it's uh, effectively I think just going to become the way that people uh, the companies are going to do it um, and then they, I think that's where the real way to make a business case is is like um, uh, there was something on one of the recent um, podcasts from from the SFC actually it was that um, open source uh, people pay for services and so open source is, is awesome um, so you should do it and then if you want to make a living doing it then you offer some service around it and I think that that's really the, the sweet spot for people uh, companies that want to um, continue to be viable with this new standard uh, it's like why go and recreate the wheel when there's a standard that exists and you could just uh, continue to make it better uh, and offer just better support and better services around that and I, I think that it's interesting to see that it's it's definitely almost happening in a landslide now uh, with HP you know the fact that HP um, HPE sponsored the conference that to me is um, is such an impressive thing that people don't really I think appreciate fully uh, unless you know the history about it more but if you look back to the very first Selenium Conf in 2011 um, there was it started where they would always every year up until I think a few years ago they stopped doing this but there was this graphic that they would show they being probably like Jason Huggins or Simon someone would get up and, and they'd show this graphic which was demand of jobs in the industry and it was like Selenium versus commercial tool vendors specifically HP <laughs> and, and it was like it was this competing thing around like oh, I think Selenium is gaining on HP and then it got to a point where it was like oh no like Selenium won like it was the war is over uh, and, and now it's like there was now it's almost like history was written as like there was no war HPE is now a sponsor at the conference you know it's like and it's just um you see that you see companies like Telerik and SmartBear uh, and uh, you see like a litany of others that are starting to follow suit um, and so I think it's awesome and I don't think that we need to have a plan <laughs> I think it's the commercial tool vendors are realizing that they need to have a plan um, and, and those, those are my thoughts at least on it on the topic yeah, I definitely agree and like you said with HPE uh, the new product it's really crazy it's 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 almost building on top of selenium and like you said smartbear all the other companies really if you want to be successful at automation nowadays you need to embrace selenium so it's almost like dave said uh, it's up to vendors now to support it because it is the standard it's it's also one one more thing i i like to say is um that i think that there if, for people who are getting into test automation, if you don't know what Selenium is, you will eventually because no matter what tool you use, you'll ultimately be using yeah. WebDriver under the hood. So, um, so those are my those are my initial thoughts. And I don't know if Karen and Ashley, if you have anything to add to that. Um, not much to add. I mean, I know there's no formal 1-800 Selenium number, but I will say that the community itself is incredibly supportive. So if you are finding, think, you know, join the Slack channel, ask questions, you will get answers. Um, you know, it's it, like I said, just incredibly inclusive, um, and yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, that, that's awesome. That's a great point to bring up. The um, so if you're curious about finding a way to connect to uh, the chat channel, there's there's two as I mentioned, and they both connect to the same place. IRC, um, for those of you that don't know, is probably the world's greatest chat protocol <laughs> that still lives on, and hopefully will <laughs> live on beyond our our years. Um, so if you um, if you go to um, if you just Google a Selenium IRC chat channel, I think you should find a blog post I wrote on Elemental Selenium about connecting to it. Like, what is IRC? How do what are the chat clients? How do you connect? And how do you get to fr the free node uh, IRC chat channel? And then there's also um, a Slack channel, which I uh, I think there's like a specific page you can go to. Like, if you just Google like Selenium Slack channel, you should be able to find something where it's like you you request to sign up and get an account, and then you can join that way. Um, and then that 
that's a great place to go. Probably the best place to go um, to ask questions and just see what's going on because um, it's where all the committers hang out. It's where other practitioners hang out, and and quite I, I see dozens of questions get answered a day um, that are that are either like the most um, fundamental starter questions, and then there's more intermediate and more advanced questions, and and everyone kind of rolls up their sleeves and tries to help out. So. Also, you get to see exactly what's happening um, in terms of bug fixes, when the next release is, that kind of stuff. So you definitely get um, kind of an ear to the ground uh, of what's happening in the project, which is really great also. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add, Karen, um, about open source versus commercial. No, I think, I mean, it basically covers it. I think the reason why the Selenium is such a re has such a rich commercial ecosystem is because it's free and open source. And if it were a single commercial product, um, you just wouldn't see this kind of uh, you, you you wouldn't see this this uh, amazing community and the, the the advantages that Selenium have it are part and parcel connected to its status as being a free and open source software project. Awesome. Um, so I know that a couple of us have a hard stop, but uh, I, there's one kind of maybe more softball question um, that came in about uh, Joe. You mentioned uh, a single protocol. Uh, I think you're referring to the, this question is referring to your mention of the star driver. Uh, I was curious if maybe you can just elaborate more on on your takeaways from from uh, Dan and Yosef's talk uh, about the star driver and some of the implementation. Yeah, sure. So, uh, like Dave said, all these videos are available free on YouTube, so you definitely want to check it out. Uh, Dan was just uh, showing a demo of how using uh, Appium they're able to create what they're calling a star driver, which can work against both Mac and Windows to drive not only browser applications, because that's what Selenium is for, is browsers, but also the client applications. So they had uh, someone from Microsoft do a demo how they were able to automate a calculator using the same protocol that Appium uses, basically. So it's really cool because not only will you be stuck to a browser, but if you're like me, you work for a large company, a lot of times you have uh, legacy applications, you need to automate more than browser applications. So that's why I was really excited about that particular uh, yeah, driver. Yeah, that's great. And, and fundamentally, that's actually using WebDriver uh, right. And, under, yep. and, right, under the hood, which is the spec we just talked about. And, uh, and that's the same thing Selenium's using. Um, and actually, there's, there's one, uh, one more point, which is um, Jonathan Lips in London last year gave a talk about Stardriver, a little bit more about the history of the project and the direction that this, this whole notion uh, and vision for Stardriver. And it's great to see now, fast forward to last month, uh, back to the future. Uh, that's, it's, <laughs> great. <laughs> it's great that uh, there was an actual implementation demonstration. Um, so, and that was actually the first talk we've ever had uh, at the conference that was three people, <laughs> which was kind of a, like, kind of a surprising, and it worked, it worked really well. And so that's another good talk to check out. I was blown away by it, actually. Just, just, it's just wow. so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Blown it was away. one of those, one, it's, it's funny. There's no, um, up until not, up until this year, there's not ever been an Appium conf. And we actually keep hosting a lot of Appium talks because it's based on yep. WebDriver. And uh, just one more plug um, AppiumConf.com. Uh, there's actually going to be an Appium Conf later this year um, in London, so so do check that out as well. Um, and I want to thank everyone that attended and everyone that's watching this video after the fact, um, and uh, thank you. And everyone that submitted questions, uh, sorry that we didn't get to them, but we'll do our best to um, go through them and uh, cherry pick a few and maybe do a follow-up up blog post as well. But thank you to the panel. Thank you, Ashley, Karen, Joe. Uh, this is a great time. I'm glad we got to talk about it. Thank you. Thanks, right. Dave. Thanks, right. Thanks everybody. Yep. Cheers. Bye.